Hello, and welcome to this enhanced podcast from Enlightening Science, the outreach wing of the Newton Project at Sussex University. We're dedicated to providing resources to help improve the understanding of Isaac Newton, his importance to both his own time and ours, his influence and his thought. I'm with Alexi Baker of Oxford University. Alexi is an expert on the 18th century trade and scientific instruments in London, and she's going to be talking about the instruments, their makers, and their role in the experimental lectures which flourished in the 18th century. London is their North Star. In this, the first part of her talk on experimental lecturing in the 18th century, Alexi discusses the place of London in the trade and manufacture of scientific instruments. century England was a hot spot of enlightenment activity and thought. In this atmosphere, lecturers on Newtonian philosophy worked hand in hand with scientific instrument makers. These craftsmen and entrepreneurs made most of the instruments which the lecturers used to demonstrate Newton's theories, and which they sometimes sold to their audiences. Some of the early instrument makers also advertised, hosted, and even delivered talks themselves. And the production, sale, and representation of their wares was as important as public lecturing in spreading the word of Newton's advances and enhancing popular reverence for him. There were, however, aspects of the relationship between lecturers and instrument makers beyond the obvious. Before the 20th century, historians tended to hold a rather romantic view of early science, or natural philosophy as it was then called. They interpreted it as a series of clear-cut marches towards progress and enlightenment unsullied by influences beyond the intellectual and sometimes the religious. This oversimplification extended to views of public lecturing and of the instrument trade as well. Many 19th century historians would have embraced, to the exclusion of all else, images like this. This is the well-known painting A Philosopher Lecturing on the Orrery, which was completed by Joseph Wright of Derby in 1766. In the painting, an imposing and somewhat Newtonian-looking lecturer holds court over a large instrument of gleaming brass and wood, which was known as an orrery. The orrery's geared mechanism rotates small models of the known planets around an oil lamp that represents the sun, in order to depict the structure and movements of the solar system. Although the scene is set in a home, albeit a wealthy home, it is still essentially serious and reverent. It is reverent towards learning, but no doubt also towards a reflective worship of God, who created the solar system on display, and whose divine solar light is illuminating the lecturer and his audience. Looking at an image like this, it is difficult to imagine anything other than academic curiosity and spiritual feeling influencing the tableau. However, early science and lecturing, and especially the trade in the instruments which both employed, largely existed outside of this closed and aesthetically pleasing sphere. They instead mainly existed in the messy, bustling, and very commercially oriented streets and waterways of London. There were actors of the Enlightenment in other parts of the country. For example, here in Oxford, there were Newtonian lecturers and natural philosophers, including John Theophilus de Segulies, John Keel, and John Whiteside. There were also some instrument makers, such as John Prugine and Benjamin Cole. The basement of what is now the Museum of the History of Science was used as a chemistry lab for experimental philosophy, while upstairs lectures and demonstrations were given in the School of Natural History. But the majority of English lecturers and instrument makers were still based in London at this time and were most influenced by the capital. In 1707, John Chamberlain wrote to this dynamic city, it is observed that in most families of England, if there be any son or daughter that excels the rest in beauty or wit, or perhaps courage or industry or any other rare quality, London is their north star, and they are never at rest till they point directly thither. The English capital was indeed a magnetic force during this period. Although some early prints make its streets look rather empty, the city was actually bursting at the seams with people and activity. It was a vibrant center of power and culture, production and consumption, and shipping and trade, for the nation, but also for the world. Chamberlain's provincial immigrants of quality joined tens of thousands of other people, including those from overseas, who sought financial security and advancement in London and helped to make it the most populous city in the world. It was a city filled with restless energy, as different cultures, such as that of the French Huguenots, 
introduce their own specific skills and characteristics to the milieu. Modern institutions and concepts were also beginning to take root there alongside the pre-industrial. This period saw the blossoming of banks and insurance companies, and of the newspapers and periodicals which were central to coffee house culture. Consumerism ran riot as it did nowhere else, and large-scale trading and colonial endeavors facilitated the movement of people and goods. The capital also refused to be contained geographically, continuing to spill beyond its medieval walls in all directions and across the Thames. You can see it in this map completed by John Rock in 1746. Broadly speaking, the center in the expanding western side of the city hosted the majority of the more affluent and influential citizens. The eastern side was more geared towards sailors and the craftsmen and retailers who catered to shipping-related trades. Some craftsmen also spread further north, while the south bank of the Thames was more oriented towards the lower classes and hosted some of the more noxious trades, including dyeing and brewing. I've added red and green marks to the map to represent the locations of known instrument makers whose careers began during the first half of the century. You can see that there were instrument makers and sellers in all of these areas, although mainly north of the river. And these different neighborhoods provided them with a wide variety of customers. This enhanced podcast has been an enlightening science production from the University of Sussex. The sound recordist was Lucy Cook. It was edited by Lucy Cook and Pete Langman. The producer was Pete Langman. Thank you.